My name is Dana Lenane, and I'm a policy communications officer here at the Kellogg Foundation, uh, moderating today's conversation. And I'm standing in for Humera Fez, one of our investment managers here at WKKF. Um, but I have supported our mission-driven investment communications work for about a decade, so I think we'll be okay. <laughs> um, it's an honor to be host this transformational conversation about place-based investing with a racial equity lens. So our conversation, our goal for today's conversation is threefold. We want to better understand how to approach place-based investments with a racial equity lens. Next, we want to inspire investors to get involved with fund managers who are reaching entrepreneurs of color and communities of color in place-specific ways. And last, we want to explore how these elements of philanthropy, venture capital, municipal financing work together to make a more racially equitable economic environment. So a little bit about the Kellogg Foundation. Children are the heart of everything we do. Um, and we know that children live in families and families live in communities. And for all children to thrive and be successful, we've learned over our 90 year history that those communities need to be equitable. So our mission-driven investment work at the Kellogg Foundation seeks to make that happen by increasing capital and widening financial systems for entrepreneurs of color. And we do that not just through participation, that's certainly part of it, but we, what we ultimately and fundamentally want to do is reshape capital markets. And that means we're challenging deeply held and deeply misinformed narratives about entrepreneurs of color and about risk. We're figuring out what types of financial supports create the most supportive and wraparound structures for entrepreneurs of color. And we're creating networks of entrepreneurs, fund managers, institutional investors, all of those committed to advancing racial equity. But today we're gonna to do some deep dives in place-based investing and we're gonna go a little bit deeper. We'll talk about several places, but we'll go a little bit deep on Michigan today. And as folks may know, Michigan is the home state for the Kellogg Foundation and it is one of our priority places. In Michigan and in, in all of our priority places, we're trying to build a more equitable economy for all. And I just want to share a little bit of data fact. So the Michigan business case for racial equity, we found through some economic modeling that by 2050, if we close those racial inequity gaps in our systems and our structures, the state stands to realize 92 billion gain in economic output. And I want to be clear, that report was conducted before the pandemic. So we really look at that as a floor. The opportunity is huge here um, because of the demographic shifts and other conditions. You know, we know people of color will power Michigan's fiscal future. So today, today we're joined by a couple of our partners in our portfolio, all of whom are unleashing capital, engaging in innovative research and changing policies to create new pathways for opportunity. So Chris, Chris Rizek, CEO of Renaissance Venture Capital, Chelsea McDaniel, Senior Fellow Activist, and then my colleague, Yazid Moore, who's a program officer with the Kellogg Foundation. As a reminder, please use, um, drop your comments, questions in the chat, we'll be monitoring. We'd love to get some dialogue in there as well. But I am gonna ask our panelists to kind of kick it off, introduce yourselves, and talk about how your work in Michigan and how it advances racial equity in the state. So Chris, why don't I kick it off to you? And if you're not speaking, would you guys mind muting? And that's great, wonderful, thanks guys. Chris. Thanks, Dana. Yeah, it's really great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm glad to be on this panel. So um, we started Renaissance 13 years ago um, because we understood that access to capital is one of the one of the huge drivers for economic growth around the country. And yet in the world I've lived in for 20 something years, venture capital, um, more than 80 percent goes to three states and one of them is not Michigan. And so the idea behind Renaissance is how can we attract capital from around the country into Michigan, because we saw great opportunity here uh, for startup companies, for new industries, et cetera, and we just weren't getting our fair share. So the idea behind Renaissance was we created a fund of funds. So that means we don't invest in startups, we invest in the venture capital funds that invest in startups. We invest around the country in venture capital funds under the condition that they come here to look at Michigan startups. Understanding our check alone wouldn't do that. So we then created sort of this more holistic view where we said, we're going to help find the startups. So we'll work with community groups, with universities, with accelerators, and we will gather information. We will help coach up startup companies, ultimately to present them to venture capital funds around the country. And we created something we call the hot list which at any point identifies, here are the 50 or 60 hottest young companies 
in Michigan that are looking for capital. But we also looked and said, once we make this introduction, what is the other thing the startup needs? And that's customers. And so we started Renaissance actually reaching out to major corporations in Michigan who agreed ultimately to not only invest in our fund, and we've raised about $300 million to date, um, not only to invest in our fund, but to agree to look at becoming customers of startups that come out of this. And what we found is that quite often there were major needs that these companies had that could only be solved by a startup. And so we'll talk later about some of the ways we do this. Um, but that was the idea behind Renaissance. We were really the place-based piece of what we talked about. But what we found over time is if entrepreneurs in the Midwest are in the shadow of venture capital, tough to find, entrepreneurs of color in the Midwest are absolutely invisible. And you, know, you look at whatever measurement you want, um, and it's pretty dire. So what we then had to do was look at how can we take and bring up entrepreneurs of color to at least get them at the table. What we do as a fund is we get entrepreneurs at the table and get venture capital funds to look at them. And what it meant is we had to help find new sources of capital at the very earliest stage to bring entrepreneurs up, but also had to look at what are the other things they need from the standpoint of mentorship and um, tools and infrastructure. Uh, and again, we'll talk later about how we do that, but with the idea of ultimately making it so that we're bringing up all entrepreneurs and they are all beside each other at the table with access to venture capital from around the country. So that's a hopefully a short explanation. And by the way, it's worked really well here. Um, we've been able to attract to Michigan about $2 billion worth of capital. Um, and we've helped about 150 startup companies to get contracts with major companies in the region. Thank you, Chris. Chelsea, why don't you, uh, I'll kick it over to you. Introduce yourself, please. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Chelsea McDaniel, she, her pronouns, and I'm a senior fellow with Activist. Um, a little bit about Activist. So we are a municipal investment research firm um, that focuses on something we call fiscal justice. And we believe that um, communities and cities that treat their residents fairly will realize um, strong financial outcomes. So we're a black owned firm starting in 2016 um, and we're a collection of activists, finance professionals, social policy folks, and, and a few other folks thrown in there. Um, and we really uh, built kind of the, the framework for activists and fiscal justice um, in the wake of Michael Brown's um, killing in 2015 in Ferguson. And just in brief about that, um, what, what kind of was, um, that what played an important role in that for us is that we, when we went down to do some rapid grant making and, and talk to folks on the ground about what the situation was there that kind of created um, this couple of things that the community lifted up to us that were really significant and really honed in on the significance of um, kind of this community driven insights and, and analysis. Um, so those two things were that we, we saw um, increasing policing of, of the majority black population there um, to do basically one thing. And, and that was um, to kind of enact the city's policy of taxation by citation. So extracting wealth from that community um, to help make up the significant revenue shortfall uh, in the budget. And so that was increasing police interactions um, and, and ultimately creating the environment where um, this really tragic uh, uh, police killing happened. Um, as we dug into that and, and other um, cities, we kind of expanded this view of uh, municipal finance um, being an avenue for engagement on a lot of the, um, the justice issues we see in cities. Um, and so our work focuses, um, just like that, that very first um, time we went down there, our work focuses on um, bringing in two main things. One, we're bringing in, and I think at the core of it, is what organizers on the ground, folks who know the story of the place, um, elevating that insight and research, which isn't currently looked at um, in the municipal market, and where they're identifying risk and problems, and then bringing in um, our own data set of things that are currently not considered um, and combining the two to paint a different picture 
of the, the fiscal uh, and the financial health of, of cities. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about how we engage um, with community members and what we do about that. I think the, the last thing I'll say on the introduction, because I, I talk a lot about um, municipal bonds and sometimes I get I get those blank stares from my family too. So municipal bonds, when we're talking about that, I'm really just thinking, think of them as like I use to municipal, to governments, to cities that go to pay for everything from schools to police settlements. Um, and so that, that, that covers a lot there. Um, and I think what's, um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but what's significant about that is, is, um, who has power in that. Um, and I think right now what we've seen with municipal bonds is that the power oftentimes, um, is with the municipal bondholders and the credit rating agencies. And there's a lot of embedded, um, biases and racism in that that um, ultimately ends up supplying, providing money that supplies these, these bad practices um, that have negative outcomes for folks on the ground. And the piece that we feel like is missing and we're trying to elevate is the folks on the ground um, who are most impacted by that, using this as, as sort of just another lever um, to help push for, for substantial change um, for folks on the ground. And I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Chelsea. Izzy? Thanks, Dana. Uh, Yazid Moore, uh, Program Officer at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Glad to be a part of this conversation. So, you know, we know that small businesses are a key driver, uh, you know, of the overall economic vibrancy, you know, and the financial security and health of family communities here uh, across the state of Michigan. Uh, as an established anti-racist organization, we understand uh, that in order for everyone to thrive in today's economy, we must address racial inequities. Uh, so along those lines, we're making at the foundation intentional and long-term investments uh, in partnership with grantees and investees to deploy capital to entrepreneurs and communities of color, which have been locked out of. So some examples, um, in Detroit, uh, we partnered with the J.P. Morgan Chase uh, to launch the Entrepreneurial Colors Fund in 2015. Uh, to date, that fund has loaned more than $10 million to entrepreneurs throughout the city. 97% of those bars are people of color and 55% are women. The loans have helped create and retain more than 1,100 jobs. So when you talk about the impact of the work, that's what the impact of the work. You know, for us, that Entrepreneurial Colors Fund was in many ways kind of like our launch pad investment in this space in Michigan. Uh, because it helped us do a couple of things. One, it helped us kind of identify lessons, learnings, uh, pain points, uh, you know, when considering other investment opportunities. And some of those things include the importance of TA, technical assistance, pre and post, uh, flexibility, and thinking about putting together loan funds and packages. The, you know, the piece about, you know, being explicit, uh, and we can't leave that out and can't be understated, but being explicit uh, about racial equity uh, and building on ramps to create those opportunities and wealth for community of colors in the ways that Chris kind of mentioned on earlier. If, if Michigan was being locked out of venture capital opportunities, what do you think communities of color were being locked out of as well, too? So when we take a look at the work that we've done in Detroit, you know, as I said, kind of our launch pad investment, you know, we begin to kind of sprinkle those learnings to other places. So in Battle Creek, you know, our hometown where our mothership is located. You know, we brought together local partners to launch a $10 million small business loan fund to spur economic development. Uh, that fund was uh, led by Northern Initiatives, a community financial development institution who provides that capital and TA that we talked about early to small business owners who are deemed too risky for funding by traditional lenders. So as we know, COVID-19 had a disproportionate impact on, impact on Black brown and women-led businesses. Lack of access to PPP, or in many cases being exclusively locked out of, showed us the challenges for these entrepreneurs with traditional banking. Even before the pandemic, we knew that access to capital was a trouble spot for groups like Black business owners, as they were denied loans at twice the rate of their white counterparts per findings from groups like the Center of Responsible Lending. So taking those lessons we talked about looking in Grand Rapids, right, of working with a group called Grande Progress Capital, who's a racial equity oriented community development financial institution and addressing the relief funding gap by deploying flexible loans. Again, talking about the learnings that we've gathered from Detroit, 
about the flexibility in creating these loan packages and funds and actually being able to, you know, provide that capital to entrepreneurs. But one of the things that Rondé did that was really helpful throughout this process is that, you know, looking at the technical assistance piece and actually bringing community a part of that conversation to talk about what they need, right? And the work that we did in Grand Rapids was really in response, a direct response of looking at what COVID-19 had done in terms of looking at the rollout of the PPP and particularly us hearing fears early on that, you know, maybe 90% of businesses owned by people of color would be locked out of that process for opportunities for several reasons, whether that was they didn't have relationships with banks or whether some other things that really made it difficult for the communities that we care about to be able to kind of help them to develop in that wealth and opportunities. You know, another bright spot in 2019, you know, more than $260 million was raised or leveraged by WKKF grantees focused on women and people of own businesses. During the pandemic, you know, those grantees utilized that funding made available through our foundations, a grant making process and leveraged those opportunities through CARES Act to ensure that equitable access to employment opportunities continues across the state. Again, building on the learnings that we've kind of looked at and looking at that launch pad investment in Detroit and then begin to kind of go deeper and sprinkle some of those lessons and opportunities in places like Battle Creek and Grand Rapids, but also being able to spread those lessons across the state as well, too, as we think about creating opportunities for communities of color, businesses owned by communities of color to be able to kind of access the capital and resources. Easy, thank you. And thank you all. So let's dive in with some questions. So Chelsea, you talk specifically around community voice and community driven and, and the data and the research, right? I mean, even as simple as just aggregating by race, right? And looking at those numbers. Talk a little bit more about the community community voice, looking at that data. How? Why do you do it and how do you do it? Great, thanks. And I think I'll, I'll use the example of um, we did a kind of deep dive research into the Flint, the recent Flint settlement bond. Um, so I'll try to use that as an example for, for kind of how we work. Um, so our work with on, on and our research on that really began with um, kind of standing relationships with some academics in the, in the area who've worked in that area, other um, activist investors, and then um, actually Yazid put us in contact with some other great folks on the ground there who are doing amazing work, um, who kind of raised the issue. Now, obviously, no, there's no issue with there being a settlement, um, but there were a lot of concerns that came up around um, substantial, or, or the lack of, rather, um, policy changes um, and substantial behavioral changes um, in, in, con in conjunction with this. Um, so our process for that kind of went with like um, started off talking to some of those folks on the ground and and figuring out what where was what was the status of things right now. Um, obviously, there was there was a community call um, for some some sort of financial restitution, um, but there were other things that that weren't um, that hadn't been uh, thresholds that hadn't been met or needs that hadn't been met as well. Um, at one point, we um, spoke to uh, um, someone at Flint Rising, Nayira, who um, framed it up as, as basically what would it cost to, to make Flint whole? Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, wasn't, it wasn't just this settlement. Um, and so I think our job as, um, you know, investment researchers, I don't know if something changed there. Sorry, my screen just went a little weird. Um, you can still see me. Okay, great. It might just be the chat popping up. Anywho, um, so we we kind of worked, um, we start with kind of measuring the risk uh, and we kind of do our deep dive into that with our own data sets. We kind of did this in conjunction this time because we had such great community partners that were sending us stuff at the same time. And so that's really the, the next part of is this community sourced intelligence. You know, this is the picture we're getting from a traditional finance analysis, adding these fiscal justice indicators um, and then what the community source intelligence is telling us of the story of how we got here, which many of us know in the case of Flint, but the story of really how folks are living on the ground right now and what their asks are in response to this municipal bond um, and how the state might show up differently and to, to meet some of those very um, real needs of the people. Um, and then our, our third step kind of with that is, is releasing this research and elevating ways that bondholders might get engaged. So when I say bondholder engagement, if you think um, 
if you think of like the traditional shareholder activism or engagement, it's along those lines. It just doesn't happen very often in bonds uh, in the bond market, but we're trying to change that in municipal bonds. And so it's lifting up the specific ass of, um, of the community and particularly in Flint that was around um, lifetime healthcare. Um, that was looking at um, the pipes that were actually in people's homes that were still leech leaching particulate um, lead and the concerns there. Um, those are also some of the people that bought up um, what's going on right now, what's not, what's been going on in Benton Harbor, what is now finally getting national attention. Um, and I say that just because I can't stress enough how important that that local insight is. You know, we can, um, we, we like to add in and add what the financial risk um, is of that and try to make the argument to investors on this is this is an uncompensated financial risk and and doesn't make sense socially or financially and that's the, you know there's a reason and a case a business case there um, for advocating for change for that but I think we you know we really rely on the folks on the ground who have that tremendous insight um, and I think the final goal there is really then to to shift that capital and power back to communities so use our position as researchers and lean on municipal finance to help do that. That's great. Thanks, Chelsea. And Yazid, how are you, how are you lifting up community voice and why is it important? Well, you know, for us, Dana, you know, community voice and community engagement is, is key for us. It's a, it's, you know, it's a key part of what we call our DNA of the foundation, right? Particularly also along with racial equity of that being a part of our DNA. Uh, because we believe that people, you know, have an inherent capacity to solve their own problems. I've yet to become uh, meet any community that doesn't know what they want and what they need and how they articulated that. Right. The challenge for us is that how do we begin to kind of enable those conditions to let them step into that space? And so when we think about our grantees and investees here in Michigan, you know, everyone that's deploying capital uh, is also providing that critical non-financial support as well. So. And that's really in terms about how we've engaged with partners on the ground. So hearing from them what they need in these spaces, right? Yes, it's good about needing the capital, but what are some of the other non-financial support that they may actually need just in terms about how they kind of help prepare a loan application, uh, coaching, business models, right? And thinking about networks and even scaling the work. And so that's always been fundamental to us in terms of centering voice in the work, because when we center voice in the work, it shows up best. And so an you know, example I'd like to probably give around that is kind of referencing back to some of the work that Rondé Progress, uh, Progress Capital did in Grand Rapids, you know, very networked and, you know, did extensive outreach with the business community, the chamber, other community-based groups, other, you know, entrepreneur support organizations that are kind of working in that space and actually brought them all to the table to say, hey, how can we build a loan package, a loan process, right, that works for community, right, that benefits community? And so in using that firsthand knowledge to build that under that loan underwriting tool and those processes, right, you know, that really tapped into the lived experiences and resiliency of community of people who've been thinking about how to access capital. And I think that's been something that's been really understated is that really tapping into and looking at people's lived experiences as they're starting businesses, right? You know, in terms of using that as a value add as a part of that process. And so when we, you know, when they received a loan application, right? You know, we looked at those, looked at the entrepreneur and, you know, given the issues about what they might've been experiencing from an unconscious bias and discriminations and inequities, right? Uh, and use that as a part of that process to kind of like make sure that we were building a package and a level of support, right? That was being innovative but in also some ways maybe disruptive as well too, disruptive in the positive sense, right? To ensure that we are putting together a tailored package that allow communities and business owners to kind of come in here and get the support and resources that they need to actually help and support and run their businesses. And that didn't happen if we don't, if we don't not, if we're not asking and engaging community about what they need at the end of the day. That's great, Izzy. Thank you. And I think that lived experience is so important, understanding where people are at and meeting them where they're at. So I'm going to jump to a question in the chat here because it was one of the questions I had for folks. So, you know, the Kellogg Foundation, we do invest a lot in a couple of different places. And as Izzy had mentioned, we think about how we share those lessons learned and what is applicable, what is re replicable. So in Chris and Chelsea, certainly you guys work all, uh, 
Chelsea, you work all in different cities across the country. And, and Chris, when I, uh, 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 I do know that you guys are doing a lot in terms of sharing your lessons learned to other places on how to do this and how to do it well. I think I, I, I Googled you last night and you're even the, the dean of BC in Michigan right now. So I think the word's getting out. So, so what I want to hear from you guys is in terms of what are, you know, in the chat, let's see, are these, what are the lessons in place-based network? Um, what is the infrastructure that's needed? And do we need folks like a WKKF or JP Morgan to make this work? So Chris, why don't you start us off, please? Yeah, there's a lot there. I'll, 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 I'll try and go at it a little bit. You know, Gazeev is talking about something that's pretty important to us because I talked earlier about how a big part of our goal is to take, help local companies find investors from around the country. Um, and this hot list we create where we pull from the community. And we found in the first couple of years, you know, the hot list was as you would expect in the tech community. You know, there's a, there's a natural sort of organic way that that happens in Ann Arbor. You know, that's been there for decades. But if you're an entrepreneur of color in Detroit or in Pontiac or in Flint, um, you know, there isn't a natural pathway. And so we actually, we started working with uh, the foundation community and helped create something called the first capital fund because uh, we found there was a big gap of the first $50,000 to a company that could ultimately be, a, you know, a world beater. But that first $50,000 or $100,000 was difficult. And so we, we helped with foundation help. We started this first capital fund. And then later, we actually went to the state, uh, to the Economic Development Commission. And I wrote a white paper on it about how, from a state economic development standpoint, a relatively small investment could have an outsized impact. Um, and so Invest Detroit Ventures is a fund in Detroit that I chair. Um, we started this fund, but with a particular mission toward uh, focusing on under, underrepresented entrepreneurs. So, you know, for instance, last year, we we invested in, I believe it was 85 companies and 60% were women or minority uh, entrepreneurs, which in the world of venture capital is like a 10X over what you, know, you, you typically expect. And the whole idea is, you know, we create capital, we create mentorship, and then we bring everybody to the table so that when we run our hot list, when we bring in hundreds of venture capital funds into Michigan, into Michigan, now it looks like a much more representative group, and everybody is prepared to be at the table. Um, so that is a big difference, and it was partnerships that we did, uh, you know, to to do that. So that was infrastructure that we were all kind of, you know, throughout the state, we're kind of creating as we were as we were going along. But now, if you look at where the gaps are, the gaps are fewer and, and in each area, you know, we're getting there. Um, and where I think you were going with this is, you know, this is replicable. So the, the, what we found in Renaissance, you know, with the data we've received where we're, we're, we're getting startup companies capital, we're getting them customers. And really the important element is, and I, you know, I've spent 13 years convincing other people this, this isn't charity. I mean, our investors, are getting better than market returns by doing this. And, and that was, you know, I, I, when I've, and I'm sorry, I'm taking a little bit long, but when I first raised the fund, um, there was a CEO of a local company who believed in the mission. And so the company invested. And then he pulled me aside and said, by the way, I told my CFO, this is a grant. This isn't an investment. And, you know, that investor now is going to make probably four times their money on that initial investment for something that they thought was a grant. Um, so with the success we've had, we've been approached by a number of areas of the country. And we made a pretty fundamental decision early on. Um, you know, there was some thought of, you know, we'd like you to create a consulting group and consult with this. And what we sort of said is, we're just going to open source this. We will share all of our learnings with everyone. We serve on boards in, in other regions and all that. We don't ask anything for it. Our feeling is the more funds like ours there are, they're not competitive at all. The more funds like ours there are, the better it is for all of us. And we can share data, we can share you know, learnings. And so the uh, first place that we replicated this was in Cincinnati, um, which was about uh, eight years ago, in Houston, two years ago. And actually this week, uh, Milwaukee was the third location. And then the next one that's been announced is Dallas. 
And again, a completely open source model, run locally, because we really feel you have to have local people who understand the region doing it. But we've got, you know, 13 years worth of best practices that we can share with them that, you know, are probably 90% effective uh, in their region. That's great. Thank you, Chris. And, and Chelsea, what are you finding? How are you navigating or learning from the different communities you work with? Yeah, um, thank you for that. I think um, I think the thing we've, we've learned um, over time is that framing is a big piece of this, that the reason there, well, one of the reasons why there are a number of these social and financial risks um, and, and they kind of exist on um, and without having an impact on the financial space, it seems like, or the market's not responding to them is because they're not seen as that. And so we, um, we actually, there's a recent study that was just published um, out of the, the Wharton ESG lab that used some of our data and looked at, um, you know, the different indicators and if they were, ha were material in predicting the outcomes of these municipal bonds. So on the making the financial argument side of it and framing um, you know, increased uh, policing and, and harassment and surveillance of people and the risk that that caused the long term risk of settlements of whatever, uh, many other things or um, the risk in the case of, of, of Flint of um, being allowed to take on additional debt when they had already met their debt cap. Um, they're, they're, that's, um, we're, we're realizing that the framing and the urgency behind it behind it is um, really important for folks. And so we've laid out a, a fiscal justice framework um, that helps people understand these things actually are material, even though they're not currently um, being treated like that, at least in a financial way. And then I think the second piece is getting this, this data together. Um, and so getting that from the, the community, um, we recently launched a credit rating firm to help facilitate that. And so um, we are training community members and partners on how to, um, how to integrate some of this data and collect and share this data um, and do these types of analyses of their own cities um, so that folks own part of that process too and collecting the data. Um, and there's uh, a certain amount of um, community authenticity with that as well. Um, but that, that is, that's taking, yeah, that's, that's an issue. That's an area where um, scaling up is, is, uh, is going to be a process. I think um, right now this, those, the, the data we're collecting and the data the community members are providing, it's not on your regular annual, you know, your CAF or your report for the city. Um, shoot, sometimes the stuff they're supposed to be reporting on is not yet in there yet, despite the, the new regulations on that. So um, that's, that's where I think the, that further infrastructure um, is needed. And we're, we're trying to build that out. And I mean, more times than not, we, we go to community members. We were just talking to some folks in, in Louisville and they have done the door to door uh, visits to understand the dynamics of evictions and how policing is connected to um, developments push to try and uh, push people out of a historically black neighborhood there, uh, the Russell neighborhood. Um, and so they have that data where they're asking, they know the right um, Freedom of Information Act requests to ask for, and they've got those FOIA requests for us. Um, so it's really, it's, it's in a lot of ways enabling a platform and, and helping to give them a framework um, and then translating that into the financial risk and, and doing our part um, to, to mobilize bondholders to um, advocate on behalf of those, those community asks. Thanks. Chelsea, thank you. And that both of you share the importance of that data looking at different data sets, sharing data. So I think that's some really good learning lessons there. And Chelsea, I can tell you've spent time in Louisville. I, I was raised there and uh, you said it right. <laughs> so I want to go, I want to go back to, you know, when we look at the opportunities, we often try to pull the right levers um, to advance our work. So I want to understand how do you tap into those levers? How do they intersect? So I'm talking about policy, grant making, investment, and I'm going to throw in their narrative too, because you guys all have yeah. talked about that. Um, and even Yazid, you had mentioned being explicit about racial equity. So Yazid, why don't you start off a little bit, please? Yeah. So you know, you know, you know, to achieve racial equity, right? When we think about this, we must take a systemic change approach to the work, right? It has to be about systems change, and so. You know, at the foundation, you know, obviously we we deploy, you know, both capital and investment 
capital, but alongside those other tools that you talked about, right? We talk about things like narrative change, right? And begin to kind of have intentional conversations about, well, what are we solving for, right? And how do we begin to kind of create equitable opportunities for those that we're looking at? And so, you know, when we think about, you know, the interventions and investments, you know, that we're making in this space, you know, I kind of touched on it earlier. It's about really disrupting, right, the existing policies, you know, that, uh, you know, that, you know, push these inequities. And as in the case, as we saw, like in the first rounds of PPP deployment, right? And so we're making these investments and we're making these intentional conversations and having these conversations around racial equity and narrative change because we're thinking about institutions, about the, the policy failures, right? That allow things, uh, uh, you know, in terms of like how PP was deployed and, and how banks may be a little hesitant and resistant to lend to, you know, the people that we work on behalf of. And so it kind of takes me back to the story, of, you know, of uh, uh, Adrian Bennett, uh, who's Michigan's first female plumber, right? Uh, you know, and a master plumber at that, right? And founded her uh, firm called Bencari. And so, you know, she secured, you know, a contract to kind of help, you know, build that new basketball facility uh, in downtown Detroit. But, but you know, that project required her to, you know, invest hundreds of thousands of dollars up front and permits, you know, to be able to kind of get rental equipment and all those other things. She didn't have that type of access. She didn't have that type of capital. But what was there for her to be able to do is that, you know, we had an Entrepreneurs of Color Fund where she was able to tap into that tap into that fund to begin to kind of like cover some of those things that allowed her one, not only just to pay her, her workers, but also to think about the permits and the equipment rentals. And so, you know, with that proper funding, right. Uh, you know, she was able to access that capital. Right. And so all the things that we do, you talk about these spectrums, right. You talk about policy, grant making investment, you know, these are the spaces that we step in, right. To really try to be disruptive from a very positive way. Right. And I think when we're most successful is that when we're being disrupted and we're being pushing in terms about looking at opportunities to really kind of like create these opportunities in space for people who've been locked out of traditional capital means to be able to kind of access those things that hadn't been available to them in the past. Thank you, Zed. And Chris, how are you guys kind of leveraging these? You know, one of the things, I'm going to follow something Z talked about. You know, um, one of the things we had to deal with is when dealing with large organizations, they put things in buckets often. And we had to challenge those buckets. So when we started doing this, and I mentioned it a minute ago, somebody said, well, this is, this is a grant, so it's going to come from this small pool of grant money. And what we were challenging was the notion that you can accomplish certain social missions that you have and certain societal missions, and it doesn't have to come from kind of this money that's thrown on the side. You know, that there isn't, there, there's a false choice there between, you know, doing good for the community and actually, you know, doing something that makes financial sense for you. And that was the big push we had. So we were able to draw on, um, you know, I would say if you looked at the money that came into Renaissance, very little of it would have been money that would have gone toward the kind of social mission that we have. It was, you know, money that would have gone to into a bank account or into something else. And we were able to use that without pulling from the grant side of the house. We were able to use the investment side of the house to accomplish certain goals. And that was, that was a, a pretty important development for us. And it took us probably five or six years to prove it out so that we no longer had to kind of, we no longer had to go into, into rooms and hear that choice and try and um, try and have them unlearn something that had been, you know, kind of deeply rooted in the organization. Thank you, Chris. So I think we want to do, I want to, I want to ask all the panelists, what else is needed? You know, how do we build a role map for others to do this work in places? Chelsea, why don't you kick it off? Hmm, I think, um, so in, in addition to what I was saying about the framework and the data, I think um, some more robust understanding of uh, municipal finance and that it really does fuel um, or, or act as a supply line oftentimes for these inequities in cities. 
um, I think for both um, investors to understand whether those are holdings that they have or even just understanding that bondholder engagement um, is an avenue to sort of engage with these cities um, and to, to push for change. I think that's an important piece. Also with, with activists um, and organizers on the ground, I think um, a lot of folks, they, they tend to know what the issues are. And, and I think educating as well around like municipal finance can also be a tool um, and, and helping make it, make that accessible and available for um, them. And I think, yeah, I think those are the main things that the data piece that I keep coming back to um, and just the, the infrastructure around that feels really important. So we're addressing the right things when we, when we do do the bondholder engagement um, and campaigns. Great. And Yazid, I'm going to ask you, what, 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 what are the gaps? What do we need to do? Well, you know, you know, Danny, you touched on something earlier, you know, around, you know, what, what the what is, right. And really what the what is, is that we're doing work to kind of reshape uh, capital systems for racial equity, right. That's the work. That's the main thing. That's the main thing. Right. And so, having foundations and other institutional investors, right, you know, who are able to kind of accept that increased financial risk, right, you know, during the startup period to kind of create and help support and grow these promising and innovative business models, right, to begin to can ensure that we're building those on ramps and those pathways for uh, entrepreneurs of color and communities of colors to build wealth, right, and to and to gain opportunity in spaces in, in that regards. And so, I you know, one of the other things I think that, you know, can't lose sight on is that, you know, we kind of talked about this earlier too, is that, you know, knowing that, you know, I think it's been important around the PRIs, but also knowing too, that there are complementary things that we can do in addition to a PRI, right? And thinking about the technical assistance that we can pro probably provide organizations, that non-financial capital, right? And I think sometimes often people just think, well, the money's there, that's all they need. Well, no, we may need some other coaching and guidance and TA. And so, you know, like I say, whether that's pre-loan or post-loan, right? Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that people are you know, being set up, you know, to be, have sustained success and to grow wealth and, and things of that nature. So I think that's one of the things that I think it's always going to be needed is that we're we being intentional about, you know, what are we actually after, right? And we're using our platforms and kind of creating those tables to really think about transforming the practices of mainstream financial institutions as it relates to opening up capital and opportunities for communities who are looking for it. Thank you, Yazid. And Chris, I'm going to throw one, two questions at you because there's one in the chat I want to make sure we hit. But what is needed? What are the, what's the gaps? What's needed? And then there's a question if you do you know of any other peer initiatives in other states or regions that are doing work that you're doing? Yeah. Um, so you know, we talked about some of the gaps in getting companies to, to readiness, but I want to flip it a little bit. And there's another gap. You know, we, we talked earlier about what are the levers you're pulling? And there's the other question of who's pulling the levers, right? And so, you know, if you look at the venture world, it looks like the problem we described with the startup companies, it's even, it's more entrenched in the venture world. And so how do you create a situation where you've got a more representative group of investors under the thesis that a more representative group of investors will invest in a more representative group uh, of companies? Um, and so, you know, that's been a, a problem. I will say there is, since the George Floyd incident, there has been more of a recognition. It's still not there yet. And I, there is a fear I have that it's kind of the shiny object right now and that, you know, it won't last. But um, you know, the, the, the challenge is there's two ways you can try to address it. You can simply play the short game and, and say, we're going to solve something right now. Or you can play the long game. You know, this is an apprenticeship business. And the idea of, Okay, we're going to create five venture funds run by um, smart, underrepresented folks who've never done venture capital is not necessarily the way. I don't think it's the way to do it. What I'd rather see is a true apprenticeship business. If I go back to my first two years in venture capital. I was pretty bad. And, you know, if I would have been thrust into running my own fund, then it wouldn't have gone well. But the idea of creating fellowships, you know, internships so that folks can rise through apprenticeships and then go out on their own if they want or take over the firms that they're in. Um, that to me is, is the way to do it. We've actually started that at Invest Detroit Ventures. We run a fellowship where we run two or three people a year, uh, typically African-American associates. 
with the understanding they're probably not going to stay, and that's fine because they're going to get recruited out into something bigger. And you know, we we're bootstrapping this. You know, we talked to some national organizations who didn't necessarily get it, so we just bootstrapped it. Um, but now we're putting people out into the community, you know, two, three at a time that are going to change things. And I think that is a big gap that needs to be addressed in a more scaled fashion than what we're doing. Thank you, Chris. So I heard a lot of good takeaways. I love how you guys, technical assistance, financial supports, coaching up, data, you know, a lot of and being very explicit. So we are going to wrap up, folks. Um, I'd really appreciate it. First, I want to thank SOCAP for hosting this conversation and being so explicit about the racial equity throughout the conference. Um, you know, closing the racial and equity gap is critical to realizing the full creative and economic potential of all Michiganders. And in fact, people were in your communities where you live. You know, I do think the models, practices, examples shared here today remind us of what's possible. An urgent call, if you will. Um, you know, Chris, you mentioned, you know, uh, hopefully not a shining object, but an, uh, hopefully an urgent call for actionable investments in entrepreneurs of color and communities of color. So, Chris, thank you. Chelsea, thank you. Yazid, thank you. Your voices, perspectives, and work is so important. And again, thank you to SOCAP and everyone who joined us here today. Be well. <laughs>